My weird school fast facts, mummies, myths, and mysteries. Written by Dan Gutman. Pictures by Jim Pellot. Part three, ancient Rome. The Roman Empire was one of the greatest civilizations in the history of the world. Wait a minute. Isn't that the same thing you said about ancient Egypt and ancient Greece? Yes, and the same goes for Rome. That's why the Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans are all in this book. The city of Rome was founded in seven hundred fifty-three B.C.E., and the Roman Empire lasted over a thousand years. During that time, Rome ruled a good part of Europe. Western Asia and Northern Africa. A thousand years—that's almost as old as my grandmother. Funny, Arlo. According to legend, it all started with two twin boys, Romulus and Remus. They were the sons of Mars, who was the Roman god of war. When they were babies, Romulus and Remus were kidnapped by their evil uncle. He threw them in the Tiber River to drown, but they didn't. A mother wolf found them and took care of them. Later, a shepherd raised them. At some point, Mars was reunited with his sons, and he told them to build a city at the spot where they were found. So they built Rome. But sadly, the two brothers fought, and Romulus killed Remus with a rock. Romulus became the first king of Rome. Hey, if I told you that story, you would be saying it had too much violins. Not violins, Arlo. Violence. I knew that, but it doesn't even matter because it's just another one of those ancient myths, right? Right. So it never happened. Probably not. Then why did you tell us all that stuff? This is supposed to be a book. Of fast facts, to the Romans, myths were facts. Since they believed Rome was started by the son of a god, they felt it had to be more powerful than any other city. An average day in ancient Rome. Let's look at what a typical day was like in Roman times. The first thing you do in the morning, of course, would be to turn off your alarm clock. They didn't have alarm clocks in ancient Rome, Arlo. The first thing you do would be to get dressed. Most men and women wore a loose linen outfit called a tunic. Roman boys wore a tunic that went down to their knees. It was white, and it had a crimson border. When he became a man, he wore an all-white tunic. When a man left his house, he wore a toga, a long wool cloth that was wrapped around his body. Roman families would spin their own woolen fabric. If the family was rich, slaves were forced to do the job. Rich families also imported silk from China and cotton from India. That was very expensive. Roman women wore togas too until the second century B.C.E. when they weren't allowed to wear them any more. No fair. Married women wore stolas, which were made of linen. In cold weather, they wore shawls called palas over their stolas. Romans wore leather shoes. There were two types. Calcius was a sandal with an open toe and foot strap. Soli wore regular shoes. Senators and noblemen wore red shoes. Women wore pearl necklaces, hairpins, earrings, bracelets, and rings. They often dyed their hair and wore hair pieces to make their hair look thicker or longer. The men wore rings, sometimes one on each finger. Men and women both used pins called. Fibuli to fasten their clothes together. Kids wore lockets around their neck called bully. 
They were given to them when they were born, and they contained an amulet as a protection against evil. A girl would wear her bulla until the night before her wedding day. A boy would wear his bulla until the day he became a citizen. If a boy grew up to become a successful general, he would wear his bulla in parades. Next, it's time to talk about school, Arlo. Oh no, not that! Kids had to go to school in Roman times. Well, only the boys. What? That's not fair. I know, right? Girls should be allowed to go to school too. But you'll love this, Arlo. Not only did the boys have to go to school, but they went to school seven days a week, and school started before sunrise. And the boys didn't get dismissed until late afternoon. No, I would have to run away to Antarctica to go live with the penguins. It gets worse, Arlo. The Romans believed that a boy would learn better if he was afraid of being beaten. So if a boy did the least little thing wrong, two slaves were made to hold him down. While his tutor beat him with a leather whip, that's awful. I'll never call elementary school strict again. There were actually two kinds of schools: boys who were twelve and younger learned how to read, write, and do math. Older boys learned public speaking. It was really important in ancient Rome to be a good speaker. At least they didn't have to read books, right? Books are boring. Their lessons were mostly dictated. Paper was very expensive anyway, so students would write on a wax tablet until they proved they could write well. Then they were allowed to use papyrus. The ink was a mixture of gum, soot, and the ink from an octopus. If it was dark. The boys used candles or an oil lamp so they could see what they were doing. We should talk about what the grown-ups of ancient Rome did all day. You couldn't get a job as a video game designer or an Uber driver in those days, but you could be a haruspex. What's that? It's a lover reader. You've heard of palm readers, right? In ancient Rome, they would take the liver from a dead animal and read it. A person who did that was called a haruspex. That must have been a weird job. There were lots of more normal jobs. Most Romans who lived in the countryside were farmers. In the cities, people became soldiers, merchants, lawyers, teachers, tax collectors. And engineers, craftsmen were needed to make dishes, pots, and jewelry. Actors, musicians, and dancers were needed to entertain people. Roman fun. Speaking of entertaining people, the Romans had a lot of fun. Well, at least the boys and men did. They went swimming and had foot races, and wrestling and boxing were really popular. They didn't use boxing gloves; they wrapped their hands in cloth. Roman boys were expected to be good horseback riders, so they had to learn to do that. Hunting was also popular; they would hunt animals for fun as well as food. Boys also played ball games like handball, soccer, and field hockey. And finally, they played board games such as dice, knuckle bones, chess, checkers, tic tac toe, and backgammon. And do you know what the grown-ups like to do? The same thing grown-ups like to do now: stand around and talk. The Roman Forum was where all the action was. It was a big open area with a marketplace where business was conducted and festivals took place. Anyone who felt like it could get up and tell the crowd their opinion on any subject. This was called orating. 
When people force everybody to listen to their opinions today, it's called being obnoxious. The Romans also loved going to the theater. They went to movie theaters. No, there were no movies back then, but there were lots of plays. People could come see them for free. Once again, women weren't allowed to perform. So female parts were played by men or young boys. No fair. The actors often wore masks, and the Romans were famous for pantomime, acting without words. It must have been pretty quiet, so the audience felt free to talk out loud in the middle of the play and discuss it with the people sitting next to them. That's rude. And do you know what the audience would do if they didn't like the play? They'd throw food sticks or stones at the actors. Acting was a dangerous job back then. The actors weren't rich celebrities like today. In ancient Rome, acting was considered just above begging. But when the Romans wanted real excitement, they would go to the Circus Maximus. It wasn't like our circus. Back then, a circus was a big open-air ground used for public events. The Circus Maximus could hold up to two hundred fifty thousand people, and it was used mostly for chariot racing. A chariot is a two-wheeled cart pulled by horses. During a race, twelve chariots would circle seven times around the track. There were four teams: blue, green, red, and white. Chariot racing was really popular. Attendance was free to all. On race days, the streets would be just about deserted because everyone was at the Circus Maximus. I bet chariot racing was really dangerous. Oh yeah, accidents happened all the time. Sometimes the drivers would get trampled to death. I don't approve of such violence. What do you have against Arlo? If you think chariot racing was dangerous, you probably don't want to hear about what happened in the Colosseum. Oh, I've heard of the Colosseum. It was the biggest stadium in Rome, and it could seat fifty thousand people. It took twelve years to build. Well, Rome wasn't built in a day, you know. The Colosseum is still there. You can go there today. For its time, it was amazing. The Colosseum is four stories high and made from stone and concrete. In just three minutes, all the spectators could get in or out. It even had a cloth sunroof so people could sit in the shade on a hot day. So, what sorts of events did they have there? Ball games, dog shows, art exhibits, rock concerts. I guess in those days, rock concerts would be concerts with real rocks, huh? No, at the Colosseum they had gladiator fights. Prisoners, slaves, and even some volunteers would be sent to gladiator school. Yes, that was a thing, to learn how to fight with swords and other weapons. Then they would be thrown into the middle of the arena to fight each other, usually to the death. To the death. And that was considered to be entertainment. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Sometimes the gladiators would fight against lions or other animals. In fact, five thousand animals were killed on the day the Colosseum opened. History experts think more than a half a million people and over a million animals were killed there. That is unbelievable. Well, not all of the fights ended in death. When a gladiator was about to get killed, he might beg for mercy. Sometimes it would be up to the spectators or the politicians in the crowd to decide if he should live or die. Why? Why? Why would they have these horrible shows? The emperors put on free gladiator shows because they thought it would make them more popular. If the citizens were distracted and amused by these spectacles, 
they wouldn't notice how hard their lives were, and they wouldn't rise up and revolt. It all sounds revolting to me. I'm just glad we don't have anything like that today. Ever heard of professional wrestling, mixed martial arts, boxing? Go take a bath. After all that blood and gore and guts, the Romans must have needed to relax. I guess that's why they were seriously into taking baths. Yes, baths. They considered it an important part of a healthy lifestyle. Men, once again, no women, would go to the bathhouse to get clean and hang out with friends. The bathhouses had gardens, gyms, and libraries, and they were decorated with statues and mosaics. When you entered a bathhouse, you would take off your clothes and give them to an attendant. Then you might do some exercises in the gym to work up a sweat. Next, a slave would rub your body with oil and scrape it off. Then, you'd hit the baths. First, a warm bath, then a hot bath, and finally a cold bath. Some bathhouses also had regular swimming pools. The Romans really cared about the way they looked. Rich women would buy sweat and dirt scraped off the skin of famous gladiators. Why? Because they used it as a face cream. They also used crushed snails or the milk of a donkey as moisturizer. And that's not all. They would use crushed ant eggs to highlight their eyebrows and smear lead paste on their faces because they wanted to look pale. I don't know if they had beauty parlors, but women and men would dye their hair with oil mixed in earthworm ashes. Yuck! Oh, and the men who were going bald would rub on hippopotamus skin. The Romans were weird. As long as we're on the subject of baths, we really should mention the ancient Roman toilets. I suppose there's no stopping you, Arlo. Hey, when you gotta go, you gotta go, right? A public toilet was called a fortica, and it had multiple seats. So you would pee and poop next to a bunch of people at the same time. It must have been like a big party, a pooping party. With all those people sitting around going to the bathroom at the same time, there could be a buildup of methane gas in the sewer system. Sometimes it got so bad that the toilet would explode underneath you. Pow! I guess that was how they knew the party was over. It's times like this when I wish we didn't have to always include facts in these books. Oh, by the way, when they were done pooping, they would clean themselves with a sponge on a stick, and everybody would share it. Okay, I think I'm going to throw up. You're gonna like this one, Andrea. Do you know what chariot racers drank for energy? Milk, coffee. Vitamin water, goat poop. No, it's true. They would boil it in vinegar or grind it into a powder and mix it into drinks for a little late afternoon pick me up. And speaking of goat poop, the Roman statesman Cato the Elder said that if a baby couldn't fall asleep, the parents should put some goat dung in the baby's diaper. The Romans used diapers. What? You thought the babies would just poop all over the place? That would have been disgusting. Can we stop talking about poop now? This is grossing me out. Okay, let's talk about peeing. In ancient Rome, pee was a big business. They would gather it in public urinals. It was taxed by the government. People made their living going door to door with a big vat to collect pee. They used to sing that song, "You're in the money." Okay, that last one was a joke. Very funny, Arlo. What did they do with all that urine? You won't believe this.
They washed their clothes in it. No kidding. Pee has ammonia in it, so it was good for cleaning. You would take your clothes to a fullery where workers would stomp around barefoot in big tubs filled with pee. They were the first washing machines. That may be the most disgusting thing I've ever heard. Oh yeah. If you think that's disgusting, in some places people used pee as mouthwash. It's true. Okay, I've had enough of this. Roman technology. This is going to blow your mind, Andrea. In the year CE two hundred eighteen, Emperor Varius Avidus Bassianus invented the whoopee cushion. It's true. He would blow up animal bladders and slip them on the chairs of his guests, so it would make a farting noise when they sat down. That's really interesting, Arlo. Do you really think so? No, I just said that so I could change the subject. Let's talk about some important Roman innovations, like arches. The Romans didn't invent the art, but they used it to build bridges as well as giant public buildings, including the Colosseum. They also were master road builders. They built nearly fifty-five thousand miles of roads and highways. That's how they expanded their empire. They could move soldiers, products, and information over a vast territory. They were also the first to use road signs and mile markers. Do you know who invented Roman numerals? The Romans. So they have the perfect name. Roman numerals were invented as a way to count stuff. The only problem was that there was no way to say zero with Roman numerals. It's kind of hard to do math if you don't have zeros. I wish we still used Roman numerals today because we wouldn't have to do math. Do you know what an aqueduct is, Arlo? Sure, that's a duck that goes swimming. An aqua duck. No, an aqua duct is a sort of like a bridge that carries water from one place to another. The Romans figured out how to move water from rivers and springs to their cities many miles away. Once the water reached the city, they could collect it in reservoirs and use it for their baths, fountains, sewers, and toilets. The most amazing part is that they did this all without pumps, pipes, or machines. They moved water all over the Roman Empire by just using the force of gravity. They also invented central heating. They would warm a room from under the floor. Rich people had running water and central heating in their houses. The Romans also invented the shopping mall. The first one was built by the emperor Trajan. It had multiple levels and over one hundred fifty stores. I love shopping. In part two, we learned that the doctors in ancient Greece had some weird ideas about medical care. Well, wait until our readers hear about the doctors in ancient Rome. They thought the cure for epilepsy was to drink human blood. They thought you could cure a headache by taking an herb growing near the head of a statue and wrapping it around your neck. They thought the way to treat chains and bruises was to rub them with wild boar's poop. They thought the way to make a pregnant woman give birth was to take a stone that had killed three living creatures and throw it over the roof of the woman's house. They thought that if a woman wanted to have a baby with black eyes, she should eat a shrew, which is a small mole-like animal. Maybe that's why the average life expectancy in Rome was about twenty-five years. But that's because of the high rate of infant mortality. They say that as many as half of all the children died before they reached the age of ten. 
To be fair, the Romans also invented bronze scalpels, bone drills, forceps, and other tools that their doctors used to save lives. They figured out that dipping medical tools into hot water before surgery would prevent patients from getting infections. The Romans knew they needed a calendar so everybody in the vast empire would have something to put up on their refrigerators. So they created a calendar based on the sun with 12 months in a year. It was called the Julian calendar in honor of Julius Caesar. The only problem was the calendar miscalculated the solar year by 11 and a half minutes. Oops. A new and improved calendar was adopted in CE 1582. It was called the Gregorian calendar, named after Pope Gregory VIII. Writing used to be on clay tablets and scrolls. The Romans invented the Codex. It was a stack of bound pages, the first books. They also invented the newspaper. It was called Acta Diurna, or Daily Events. Handwritten sheets were issued every day and put up in the Roman Forum for citizens to read. The sheets gave news on politics, trials, military campaigns, executions, and scandals. The Romans also invented concrete. They combined lime, volcanic ash, and water with volcanic rocks to make a substance that was strong and lasted a long time. That's why structures like the Pantheon, the Colosseum, and the Roman Forum are still standing today. Food. Glorious food. Do you know what ancient Romans ate, Arlo? Uh, food? Right. You're so smart. One popular dish was pottage, a stew with chopped vegetables, bits of meat, cheese, and herbs. It sounds gross, but for breakfast, the poor people mostly ate bread, which was often given away for free by the government. Rich people might have some meat, fish, fruit, or vegetables to go with their bread. I knew that, but did you know that they didn't have sugar? They used honey to sweeten their food. I knew that, but did you know they didn't have forks? They did have spoons and knives, though. Slaves were made to cut up the food for rich people. A Roman lunch was usually bread, salad, olives, cheese, fruit, nuts, and meat or fish left over from the previous night. After lunch, rich people would take a two-hour break called a sexta horda. They ate slushies made from snow brought down from the mountains. For dinner, they would eat exotic foods like stork, roast parrot, flamingo, peacock tongues, and dormice. Dormice? Do you mean dormice as in mice, mice? They ate mice? Ugh, gross. You think that's gross? One popular dish was a chicken stuffed inside a duck, the duck stuffed inside a goose, the goose stuffed inside a pig, and the pig stuffed inside a cow. They would cook that whole thing and eat so much that they'd throw up into bowls that were kept around the table. Then after that, they'd go back and eat some more. It would have been a lot easier if they just invented the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. What did the ancient Romans believe? Like the Egyptians and the Greeks, the Romans believed in lots of gods. I mean, tons. There was a god of trees. Rocks had a god. Different parts of a house each had their own god. They even had a god for doors and a god for hinges. Hinges? Hinges need a god? Yeah, and so did doorways. The god of Janus protected doorways and gates to keep homes and buildings safe from evil spirits. The Romans needed so many gods that they took some of the Greeks and changed their names. The gods supposedly watched over the people. Whenever something bad happened to somebody, it meant they hadn't worshipped the gods correctly. That's why every city built temples to the gods, and citizens would visit the temple every day with offerings and sacrifices. 
Do you want to know my favorite Roman gods? I'm almost afraid to hear them. Cloacina was the goddess of sewers. Sterquilinus was the god of poop. That's right, they had a god of poop. Isn't that hilarious? Arlo, you made those gods up. I did not. Look it up in your encyclopedia if you don't believe me. Wow, you're right. But let's focus on the more famous gods and goddesses. Like Jupiter. He was the most powerful god and king of all the gods. When he got mad, he would hurdle a thunderbolt. Juno was Jupiter's wife and also his sister. That must have been weird. She watched over the women of Rome. Neptune was Jupiter's brother and the lord of the sea. His other brother, Pluto, was the lord of the underworld. Jupiter had sons, Mars, Mercury, and Apollo. Mars was the god of war. He was mean and nobody liked him. Mercury was the messenger of the gods, so he was sort of like a mail carrier. He knew everything about everybody. Apollo was the god of the sun, light, and music. There were lots of goddesses, too. Diana was the goddess of the hunt. Minerva was the goddess of wisdom. Vesta was the goddess of hearth and home. And of course, Venus was the goddess of love and beauty. Yuck! Gross! You said the L word! Oh, you'll like this, Arlo. Venus's son was named Cupid. He carried a bow and arrow with him. If Cupid hit you with one of his arrows, you fell in love with the very next person you saw. Isn't that romantic? To get hit by an arrow? I don't think so. The Romans had all kinds of other weird characters that they believed in. Orpheus was a famous musician. When he played his lyre, it would cast spells and soothe the savage beast. Vulcan made the first woman out of clay. Hercules was half man, half god, and very strong. Pegasus was a winged horse that could fly. Cerberus was the three-headed dog that guarded the entrance to the underworld. The Romans were weird. Military The military was very important in ancient times, just like it is today. The Romans had one of the most powerful armies of any empire. Roman soldiers were called legionaries. To become one, you had to be a male citizen. You had to sign up to fight for 20 years. You weren't allowed to get married until you finished your military service. If you survived 20 years, you were given land or some money. It wasn't easy to survive. You had to march as much as 21 miles in 5 hours. If that doesn't sound so hard, consider this. The whole time, you had to wear an iron helmet, armor made from strips of iron, and you had to carry a tall shield. Not only that, but you also had to lug a dagger, a sword, a spear, and a bow and arrow. The Roman army was huge. One legion included over 5,000 soldiers. A legion was divided up into a smaller group called a cohort. And the cohort was divided into groups of 80 men called centuries. The leaders of each century were called centurions, so they had the perfect name. Of course, the leader of all those soldiers was the emperor. The word emperor comes from the Latin imperator, which means military commander. Do you know how you could tell somebody was an emperor or senator in ancient Rome? They drove a Ferrari? No, dumbhead. There were no cars in those days. You could tell somebody was an emperor or senator because their clothing was purple. That was my next guess. Let's talk about some of the most famous Roman emperors. Julius Caesar never had the title of emperor, but he was a powerful general who took control of the Roman Empire from the Senate. In 44 BCE, he was named Dictator Perpetuus, 
or a dictator for life. Unfortunately, his life didn't last very long because the same year he was assassinated by members of the Senate. They didn't think one person should control the whole empire. By the way, when Julius Caesar died, he left money to every citizen of Rome. In today's dollars, it would be about two hundred seventy dollars per person. Augustus was Julius Caesar's son, and he was the first real emperor. In forty years, he built more roads, started the postal service, improved the police and fire departments, and nearly doubled the size of the empire. Caligula was not a nice guy. He killed people who he didn't like and demanded to be worshipped like a god. In the end, he was assassinated by his bodyguards. By the way, it wasn't unusual for Roman emperors to get murdered by their enemies, usually with poison. So, do you know what some of the emperors did to prevent that from happening? Every day, they would drink or eat a little bit of poison. They thought that would help them build up an immunity to it. One more thing about Caligula: he really liked horses. In fact, he tried to make his favorite horse, Incitatus. A consul, which was the most important job in the government, Claudius's family didn't want him to be emperor. But when Caligula was assassinated, there were no other choices. So Claudius became emperor for thirteen years. He wasn't a bad one either. He passed good laws and started many building projects. While he was in charge, the Romans conquered Britain. Nero was no sweetheart. At first, the people liked him because he would go chariot racing, sing songs, and recite poetry in public. But at some point, he went crazy. He started executing his enemies or people he thought were enemies. He had his mother killed, and it was rumored that he murdered his wife. Ultimately, Nero was tried and sentenced to death. Though he took his own life before he was executed, bringing a sad end to a sad tale. Hadrian traveled all across the Roman Empire. He realized it was too big to defend, so he had his armies withdraw to borders that could be protected more easily. He also built a stone border wall that stretched seventy-three miles across Britain. It was called Hadrian's Wall, and parts of it are still there today. After five hundred years of ruling a huge part of the world, the Roman Empire collapsed. Why? There were a lot of reasons. Some of the emperors were nuts, of course. There were constant struggles for power, and a lot of corruption. The Roman Empire was too big to control. There were financial problems because so much money was spent fighting wars. Christianity was on the rise. And the Romans faced powerful enemies, including Germanic tribes like the Goths and the Vandals. That's where we get the word Vandal, people who destroy stuff. Historians usually say CE 476 was the year the Roman Empire ended. The last of the emperors was Romulus, which I guess makes sense. After all, it was a little boy named Romulus and his twin brother who created Rome in the first place. Or so the legend goes. Anyway, more weird fast facts about ancient Rome. You wouldn't want to be left-handed in ancient Rome. Lefties were considered unlucky and evil. In fact, the word sinister comes from the Latin word sinistra, which means left. You know the expression "getting up on the wrong side of the bed." Supposedly, Romans got up on the right side because the left side was evil. It was hard to be a woman in the early days of ancient Rome. A woman's job was to take care of her home and teach younger women how to cook, sew, and run a household. They couldn't own property, inherit, sign a contract, work outside the home, or run a business. They couldn't defend themselves in court. No fair. Women had to be under the control of a male guardian all the time. 
That might mean her father, her husband, or even her oldest male child. So a son could boss around his own mom? That's right. Later, when Rome became an empire, things began to change and women got more rights. But they still couldn't vote or hold office. We've mentioned the slaves a few times here. It sounds awful to us today, but slavery was an accepted practice to the Romans. One out of every four people was a slave. A rich man might own 500 slaves. An emperor might have 20,000. If someone was captured in battle, he might be sent back to Rome to be a slave. Abandoned children might end up as slaves. If a slave had a baby, the baby was automatically a slave. Sometimes a father would sell an older child into slavery. Every so often, a slave would save up money and buy his or her freedom. But unfortunately, most slaves were slaves for life. What did the wealthy Romans force their slaves to do? Lots of stuff. Slaves were made to help dress their master, walk his kids to school, clean the house, wash the clothes, prepare meals, and serve food to guests. If a guest had to go home after dark, a slave might escort them with a lighted torch. Probably the only time of year that slaves were happy was Saturnalia. That was a festival in which slaves and masters would switch places. Monte Testaccio in Rome is probably the most valuable garbage dump in the world. Archaeologists found 53 million ceramic vases there. I guess they didn't have recycling back then. The month of January was named after Janus, the Roman god of beginnings. He had two faces. One looked back to the last year and the other looked forward to the new year. The month of April comes from the Latin word aperere, which means to open, like when a flower opens. The month of August was named after Emperor Augustus. Funerals have always been expensive. In ancient Rome, people who didn't have much money would join burial clubs. Money would be taken out of their salary to help pay for their future funeral. And by the way, our word funeral comes from funus, which means torch in Latin. They believed a flaming torch would guide dead people into the afterlife and scare away evil spirits. The Twelve Tables were important laws of the Romans, which they carved into tablets. Some of them were weird, like it was against the law to write a song that insulted somebody else. Another one of the Twelve Tables said it was perfectly legal to pick up fruit that had fallen on someone else's farm. The Romans had a weird system for choosing the best puppy out of a litter. Get this. They'd soak a long string in oil and make it into a big circle. Then they'd put all the puppies in the middle of the circle and set the string on fire. The mother dog, of course, would freak out. She would jump into the middle to rescue the puppies one at a time. The order that she rescued the puppies indicated which puppies were the best and which were the worst. What I want to know is how they got the puppies to stay inside the circle. Clowns were really popular in Roman times. They even had different kinds of clowns. A senio was a mime. A stupidus, yes, that's where the word stupid comes from, was a fool who was bald or wore a long pointed hat and a multicolored outfit. He made fun of the serious actors and was famous for making riddles and having slapstick fights. The first mooning in history took place in Roman times. What happened was that some Roman soldiers were sent to keep an eye on some citizens in case they revolted. A priest named Flavius Josephus wrote a description of what happened. He said one soldier lifted up the back of his garments, turned his face away, and with his bottom to them, 
crouched in a shameless way and released them a foul-smelling sound where they were offering sacrifice. That brave soldier threw the first moon and the rest is ancient history. Well, Arlo, it looks like you've managed to ruin another perfectly interesting subject by talking about pooping and peeing and mooning and other gross, disgusting things. I hope you're proud of yourself. I am.